great people from the Boston Public School Department to discuss uh, high school strategy and underperforming schools as it relates to dockets, excuse me, 0536 through 0538 and dockets 0539 through 0543. 0536 to 38 is orders for the FY18 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, and appropriation for other post employment benefits. Docket 0539 through 0543 capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd like to remind folks that this. Um, Hearing is both being recorded and broadcast on Comcast uh, Channel 8, as well as RCN Channel 82. I'd ask folks to silence their electronic devices. At the conclusion of the presentation and question and answers from my colleagues, we will have public testimony. There is a sign-in sheet to my left. We ask that you state your name and affiliation and residence. Uh, we also will take uh, testimony via written testimony through email or, or letter or any other um, method. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. Um, we have uh, Councilor at Large Anissa Sabi George to my left, as well as District City Councilor Tito Jackson to my right. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it over for your presentation. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, members of the City Council. My name is Donna Muncy. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Strategy for the Boston Public Schools. And we're going to begin our presentation to you all this afternoon um, with a focus on BPS's underperforming schools, our Level 3 and our Level 4 schools. Um, I'd like to take one minute to introduce the team. Um, to my left is Dan Anderson, the Director of the Academic Response Teams. And to my right are Liza Vito, the Director of Turnaround and Transformation, and David Bloom from the Finance Office. Liza Vito is going to start us off this afternoon. Thank you, counselors. Good afternoon. So first, wanted to address the state accountability system and really explain what are level three and level four schools. Um, if folks can see in the graphic, level three, four, and five schools are at the bottom of the graphic. All three of those accountability levels are schools that are in the bottom 20% across the state for schools of the same type. So the bottom 20% of elementary schools, high schools, K to eights, et cetera. Um, and the top portion of the accountability system graphic is levels one and two. Those are determined by how schools are doing on meeting their proficiency gap narrowing targets. So how many students are proficient? Um, level one, both all students and the high needs student group are proficient. And level two, it's either of those two groups. And when the state developed this accountability system, it was with the goal of promoting the rapid academic achievement of students and re reducing proficiency gaps by half by 2017. And in order to determine what accountability level a school is in, the state considers measures of school performance and growth, um, performance in, in English language arts, math, and science, and growth in ELA and math. It considers things like graduation and dropout rate for high schools and other measures like attendance or um, behavior rate data. Um, and then classifies students, uh, schools based on both how the school is doing against other schools in the Commonwealth, that's its school percentile, and how it's doing on its own account, accountability targets, which is its PPI measure. Um, on the next slide, we have a list of BPS's current 10 level four schools in school year 16, 17. We have four elementary schools, Channing, Grew, Mattahunt, and Winthrop. Um, in the parentheses, after each school's name, you'll see its school percentile. Uh, Dearborn STEM Academy and Middle High School, and the high schools Brighton, Dorchester Academy, the English High School, Excel, and Madison Park. BPS also has a number of level three schools. Those are schools that are in the bottom 20% compared to other schools of a similar type across the state. 
There are 53 level three schools in BPS, and 26 of those are in the lowest 10% statewide compared to schools of the same type. You see those schools listed there, those 26 schools in the bottom 10% statewide. Again, after the school's name in parentheses is the school's percentile. The district is providing a variety of supports to rapidly accelerate student growth in these schools. And a, um, a bunch of supports are listed here. Um, and the far left column, you have the supports, which I'll describe a little more, and then which how many level four schools are receiving those supports, and how many of those low performing level three schools, those in the bottom 10% are receiving the supports. The first one listed is technical assistance teams. Those are convened out of my office, the Office of Turnaround and Transformation. They are coordinated central office district supports brought to the school on a quarterly basis to both look at um, how the school is running, how instruction is working, and also to problem solve with the school, any things they feel are challenging their ability to move the needle for kids. So all of the level four schools receive those. And instructional superintendents have piloted that support in two level three schools to date. The academic response team, you're going to hear more from my colleague Dan Anderson about shortly, but six level four schools and six level three, low performing level three schools are receiving these residencies. In addition, the data inquiry team, which works specifically with schools to improve their use of data, they often help the instructional leadership team and other school teams is in both level four and low performing level three schools. Um, the next line I've noted, the state gave us a level three strategic support grant specifically for our low performing level three schools. 20 schools are receiving funded activities through that state grant this year. The grant was $450,000. Um, each year a school is in level four status, the state conducts a two-day monitoring site visit to assess the school's progress, both in classroom observations and in other systems throughout the school and how they're working. All level four schools receive this. We also chose to use grant funds from the strategic support grant to pilot this same type of visit in our low performing level three schools. So the 10 schools that receive that this year are in the lowest 5% are sort of most at risk level three schools. And then finally, the counselors may be familiar with acceleration academies where schools um, have additional learning time for students during February and or April break. And um, we have both level four and level three schools receiving those academies. Good afternoon. The academic response teams are three teams of experienced coaches who support lower performing schools with in-depth residencies. Uh, what that means is each of our teams is serving two schools at a time for about a two-month period, a little more over two months, with individual coaching, teacher team support, um, professional development and coaching that they're providing, build the capacity on instructional practices and on the collaboration that teacher teams and educator teams are doing for continuous learning. Uh, these three teams are also providing additional professional development opportunities in partnership with other district offices district-wide, so for all schools, or participants from all schools. And uh, these staff are also creating tools that can be used pretty widely. ART is a pure support mechanism, not an evaluation mechanism. It's just to help schools move student achievement. And you can see uh, a list of the schools here that have received support residencies or are currently receiving support residencies for this academic year. Um, and finally, we have a table illustrating the resources for our low performing schools. To orient you to what's here, um, the, the sort of category of support is in the left column with fiscal year 17 in the middle and fiscal year 18 to the right. Um, the top half of the table is district resources and then we've also included at the bottom some uh, grant resources that our schools either do receive or are likely to receive for fiscal year 18. The first line is central office staffing. Um, combined between both the Office of Turnaround and Transformation and the academic response teams. The second line is about that uh, extra learning time I mentioned during vacation and some other academic supports. Uh, this RC also provides support directly to individual level four schools. This can range from additional services that are needed at the school, 
additional staffing. For instance, this year, one of the um, things paid for with these funds is to add a family en dedicated family engagement person to the Mattahunt. Um, so that was something that was paid for out of this line. The next line is about PD and related support. So for both level three and level four professional development supports, training, technology related to professional development. Uh, the last line I wanted to draw your attention to is new this year, the turnaround transition funds. Um, Dr. Chang and the leadership team at BPS realized that over the years, as BPS has had many schools go into level four status, the school redesign grant funding that the state provides, which I'll talk about, when it ended after three years, there was this funding cliff. Um, they just didn't have supports anymore. So the district has committed to continuing a additional funding for those schools while they remain in level four status. Uh, that is what that line is, the turnaround transition funds. Under the total district resources line following that, we have state grants to support the level four schools. Those are the school redesign grants from the state. Those are federal school improvement grant dollars that are um, issued to us through the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. We have multiple schools with those grants this year. And for FY18, we're applying now for Brighton and Excel to also receive those grant funds. So that's the applying for number that you see in the right column. Um, and then finally, we have received state grants to support level three schools this year of $450,000. Uh, we don't know yet what that amount would be for next year. We did receive funding for that last year as well of $425,000. So we expect there will be a grant again. We just don't know how much yet. Thank you, team. I'm going to ask for the high school strategy team to join us now so we can finish our presentation to you. So they're here. Um, to my left is Dr. Ligia Noriega, currently the headmaster at the English, transitioning to central office for July 1st. Um, and then next to her is Marsha Innes Mitchell, the director of post-secondary initiatives. And to my right um, is Michelle Silvaria, the executive director of CTVE. And we're gonna start with Lujia. Hi, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to see you. And so we are going to um, spend a lot of time looking at our high schools and I don't know if we can move the slide. Uh, I don't, oh, we have, thank you so much. Right, that's my, let me see. I think we are going to talk about the budget. So the spending, as you can see, is that, uh, let me use my, that we had the central staff uh, funding in there and the high school redesign and college and career readiness. Uh, we also have the AP. We want to commit uh, still to AP, college access, and high school graduation and, and uh, success of Boston. So you can see that there's an uh, increase on $1.3 million because we want to make sure that we are going to customize the services to the school. So everything's going to be invested on how we can go and support the level three schools, level four schools to continue moving to level one or level two. So on the next page, I know it's very small print, but it's the uh, overall and the view that we want to pursue. So we have an alignment on language, common vision, and at the same time that all our efforts are aligned to these principles, if you see at the high school uh, redesign principle, we want to make sure that we are going to focus on the entire student. So not just to focus on, ac on academics, but also the emotional, social uh, components that are affecting their lives, also to the culture and language. We want to make sure that everything is, has rigor, that we can measure, so trying to make sure that we engage students in every single day in the classroom, and instead of just letting some sleeping students take naps, we want to make sure that we will continue working in the classroom so teachers can engage every single student and meet them where they are at. We want to make sure that we expand their thinking, and that is by going beyond the classroom. So instead of just applying math in the classroom, we want to make sure that they see the connection with the authentic world, what's going on outside the classroom. Dynamic, we want to make sure that we are going to promote the passion for learning. Students want to come to school because there's something exciting happening in the classrooms. We want to make sure that we are going to provide different uh, exploration sites, and we are going to be expanding some of the pathways. We also have the 
focus on co co college and career readiness. We want to make sure that the students, are, while they're in high school, they're going to be able to get some kind of certificates, credentials, so they can use those skills by finding jobs after school and being able to transition whatever they're learn learning in the classroom to apply it in a real life. We want to make sure that the student support, so as you can see, I'm going from the uh, bottom to the top. We want to make sure that the students are going to get counseling if they need it, especially our families need a lot of support uh, with things that are happening lately. Here, we want to make sure that the students are going to get the remedial courses that they need when they have some gaps. How we are going to do that, we are going to talk more about when we uh, talk about these specific schools. Work-based learning, we want to make sure students have internships and they learn the soft skills or what we call professional skills. Uh, we want to make sure that we are going to expand the career and technical education. And we want, again, to make sure everything is rigorous so the students are going to be able to compete with any other student from any other area in the United States. Our profile is, and you can see the programs that we have in the high school office is college and career readiness, advanced placement, high school graduation, college access and success Boston, career technical vocational education, or CVTE, alternative education, and also for uh, the oral basic education. So um, I'm going to uh, let my colleague, Marsha Ennis, to continue with the data. Thank you so much, Dr. Noriega. Um, good afternoon, counselors. Thank you for having us here today. As you are probably aware, we have a, a large-scale citywide college completion initiative that's been underway now for a nine-year period called Success Boston. And through the high school support office, we coordinate a number of efforts connected to that cross-sector strategic um, plan with the focus um, to increase the rigor of our high schools, as well as reduce the need for remediation upon um, college entry. One strategy that we have been using is to create an open access policy for our students to access advanced placement coursework. We support um, schools by subsidizing exam for low income students to not be locked out of that opportunity. We cover licenses um, for AP exam review sessions for blended instruction um, within the classroom. And we also coordinate with partners to offer Saturday study, study sessions for our students, particularly in the STEM-related advanced placement courses. Um, the first graph will highlight some of our data for AP course taking. There's currently 32% of our students annually. That's about 2,800 students in our 11th and 12th grade that are accessing AP, um, which is a 10% point increase from nine years ago. So we have jumped from 22% nine years ago when we began this initiative to 32% of our students um, being able to access AP. The first um, graph shows that the overall number of AP exams have also increased by 1,000. So as we increase access, as we're covering subsidies, more students are able to take their AP exams. And we'll continue to offer these services to increase the number of qualifying scores of threes, um, fours, and fives um, to allow students um, to receive that exemption um, and not have to take those um, courses when they get to college. The second um, graph is focused on high school graduation, um, which highlights our four-year cohort graduation rate, which has also been increasing over the past five-year period. And while we've been trending upwards for all subgroups, um, I just wanted to point out that we've experienced a significant increase with our Asian and Hispanic students. Our office helps schools to review their data and set goals around the ninth grade retention rates as well as um, looking at early intervention. So early and often connecting students to the supports they need so they're not stopping or dropping out of high school. We are excited that today 72% of our students are able to graduate within um, a four year period of enrolling in the ninth grade. The third um, graph highlights our college enrollment. This is um, particularly tied to my function as the director of post-secondary initiatives. Um, my focus is to create um, more connectivity between our schools and our many college access agencies 
So they are working together with school counselors and the leadership to align um, up to the school's actual goals that they have with their students and build a structured system of supports that students need to make the right decision for themselves. Um, our 16th month enrollment rates are at an all-time high. Um, it is at 71% of our students who are leaving us are entering into post-secondary within 16 months. The immediate enrollment rate, so students who are entering the fall after high school graduation, is around 65%. Um, percent. So that's pretty awesome as well. And we will continue to work with our city agencies to provide transitional coaching support as students enter into their early college years. Thank you. Thank you. So the, one of the strategies that we are going to use and we are already putting in practice is to divide the schools by the way students are assigned to them, and that is the student assignment. So you can see that we have the exam schools, admission schools that they have as some policy in order to accept students, open enrollment schools, alternative education schools, and they have uh, schools that serve a special population. If you can see in the graphic, the open enrollment schools as we have are mainly the level four schools. So one of the strategies is to provide customized services to them. We are going to tier the support by looking at data, by working closely with the, all the departments in central office to deploy the services that they need. But not just to work with level four, we are looking at level threes in order to make sure that they move up to level two and all EL, uh, level four schools can move to level three or exit the turnaround status. That is the major goal in here, and that is by customizing the services for every single school. In instead of saying one size fits all, it's not, it's not working. We are going to make sure that we go into every single classroom and see what students need. So uh, I'm going to transition to uh, Michelle Silveria. Good afternoon. We wanted to share with you four goals for college and career readiness for all students who are in career and technical education pathways. One of our goals is to improve the quality of our current career and technical education programs. Currently, we have 35 programs across about 12 high schools in BPS. That translates to about 1,800 students in career pathways and about 60 teachers who are involved in teaching those career pathways. Our second goal is to create a continuum of work-based learning experiences, including industry tours, job shadows, internships, and other career preparation experiences. Third, we'd like to increase the number of students who graduate with industry-related credentials and skills. And lastly, our goal is to increase the number of career and technical education offerings in the district and other college and career pathways. Our FY17 budget was made up of a couple of components. The first thing you'll see is the out-of-district student tuition. Um, sometimes this is called non-resident student tuition. And this is our obligation due to state regulations to provide tuition to students who seek programs that BPS currently does not offer. And so that was $1 million for school year 16-17. Our Perkins allocation, um, our grant that we got from the federal government was $1,166,000. And we also have a budget of about $22,000 for other instructional materials and supplies. So that basically made up our budget for FY17, and we will be receiving the Perkins allocation for FY18 in the summer, and expect it will be fairly similar to this year. Yeah. Next, you'll see a listing of all of our programs that we expect to be running for school year 17-18. In the first column are the Chapter 74 approved programs that have been through the formal Chapter 74 approval process with the Department of Education. And those schools include Madison Park, Austin Arts Academy, the English High School, and the Edward M. Kennedy. On the right-hand side are what we call our Perkins programs or non-Chapter 74 programs. And you can see that there are many um, sprinkled throughout 
the high schools in the city. And we also have one um, Chapter 74 application pending with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education currently for Madison Park for a programming and web development program for next year. Thank you, Dawn. Um, can you just help me understand? Oh, let, let me first acknowledge that we've been uh, joined also by District City Councilor Frank Baker as well as District City Councilor Tim McCarthy. Um, on slide three, where you have the percentiles, um, you know they they range somewhat dramatically. I think uh, you know from one to the Dearborn is twenty five. Right. Um, <clears throat> what percentile does a school have to reach to foist it into level three, let's say? Um, thank you for the question. <clears throat> so schools in the bottom 20% statewide um, are level three, four, or five schools. So to get out of that range, you have to get into at least the 21st percentile. Mm -hmm. So levels two and one are schools in the 21st through 99th percentiles. Oh. It's a much larger spread for levels one and two than it is for three, four, and five in terms of percentile. Okay. Liza, can you explain why the Dearborn would be over that? Sorry. So if there's a question, if what you're looking at is why is Dearborn above 20 but still a level four? Right. Um, so the way it works is that once a school is designated level four, it, the turnaround plan that is created is a three-year turnaround plan. So Dearborn is still in the middle of its three-year turnaround plan. It's currently in the second year of its second, actually, three-year turnaround plan. Mm -hmm. um, so next year, at the end of school year 17-18, it would be eligible for an exit decision by the commissioner. Okay. Uh, and therefore, Brighton High has, isn't even technically in its first year? That's correct. Right. So this is the designation year for Brighton and Excel High Schools. Uh, the district is working now on developing turnaround plans for those schools. Mm -hmm. The first year of those three years will be 17, 18. Right. Um, so it will not be eligible for three more years after this one. Right. And I've been in touch with Jonathan Landman, as I mentioned in an earlier hearing, who um, I believe is laser focused on what the needs of Brighton High School are and uh, continue to work with him to make sure that we get the resources needed to uh, accelerate the advancement. Um, there's obviously just too many, I, I'm sure you all agree, too many schools in level four status. And uh, to that point, are the level four status schools, uh, like say five, from five years ago to present, higher today or lower today? Um, in Boston, actually, we've had several of our level four schools that exited level four status. So former level fours have declined since they exited mm -hmm. um, into lower uh, levels. So Orchard Gardens, for instance, um, has declined and is now in the 20th percentile, which is much lower than when it exited level four status. So we are, we are, to your point, we are paying attention to those schools to make sure when mm -hmm. they exit, they don't backslide. We want them to keep going on that trajectory of improvement. Right. And I think we've heard um, from many of my colleagues that, you know, we do tend to, um, you know, allocate more resources when they, when, you know, kind of um, reactively. And then we get them to a certain point and then we back off. And I, I don't think it's all about money, but um, I don't know what else we can do to 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 keep them in their upper statuses. Um, I know um, Mary Lyon was a level one, now it's a level two, and it's always been, uh, I think, a jewel in my neighborhood as an inclusion school, as a school that um, serves you know so many different needs. It was it's it was a model for many years that I think we've expanded throughout the school system where we can. Um, so I I would just you know, say to all of you that this in particular um, is is something that we need to focus resources, attention, and um, and personnel and whatever else we can. Thank you. Yes, um, Liza, can you um, explain where were you? Had 
Oh, sorry. I was going back to the first slide with the graphic about the accountability system. I think one common misperception, and I should back up and say the state actually has put forward its proposal to the U.S. Department of Education to make some revamps to this accountability system um, as part of the Every Student Succeeds Act opportunity for states to do that. One of the pieces of feedback I know that the district provided to the state and other districts did as well is the way the current accountability system is structured is confusing to people that mm -hmm. the bottom three levels are about percentile and the top two cover such a wide range from 21st to 99th percentile mm -hmm. and that you can absolutely have schools that are level one, which uh, sort of reasonable person common sense would think level one means high performing mm -hmm. but it does it can mean level high can mean high performing but doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. um and so one of the pieces of feedback the state heard frequently was you've got to clean that up so it makes more sense to mm -hmm. families and teachers and districts and everybody else because it doesn't make sense right now right great Thank could, you. Could uh, I add one oh, comment absolutely. related to what you said? Absolutely. So um, it, during the transition of um, Dr. Chang's team into the district last year, one of the things we, we looked at very carefully was what happened to our, our schools that had been in level four and had exited. And so built into the plan, as Liza mentioned, is that when we have a school that exits, or when we have a school that exits, we are working on a step-down plan for those schools. So we've been working with budget on a plan that would allow us to, to conserve resources so that mm -hmm. the school will continue to receive somewhere between 75 and 90% of the resources they got during the time they were in level three, mm -hmm. uh, level four, and then um, step down over three or four years so that we protect the school from the what's the happened to our current ones. So it's, it's not the be all and end all. The, in, I mean, instructional focus needs to continue to be strong, and, and all the other things need to happen as well. But it is it is clear um, that the additional resources can help the school get on the path um, to 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 exit. But that um, it, it, most of the research, most of the national research on turnaround says that it really takes about five years for turnaround to mm -hmm. consolidate and become the way of the school and the way that the Massachusetts system is set up is looks at a three year improvement. Right. So even in best case of school is ready to exit in three years, it still needs time to consolidate its practices mm -hmm. and be sure that they're headed in the strong right direction. Great. And, and I think, you know, aside from the resources, school leadership, and I think that's one of the, yes. one of the, the reasons Brighton High may have slipped. I, I go way back to Juliet Johnson, who did a fabulous job for decades at Brighton High School. And literally, I've been a district city councilor now for a little over nine years, and I think we've had five uh, principals in that time yeah. uh, and I think the newest one is Rob Samedi who I hear is fabulous and has <laughs> actually very familiar with Brighton High in particular so I look forward to working with him but um, you know consistent leadership too um, is important so uh, thank you Councilor Osabi George. Thank you uh, Chair and thank you all for being here. I asked this um, question in the earlier hearing today about the state levels versus the the BPS levels, maybe you've got further insight to share. Um, for example, the Russell School, which is not far from my home, is a, level, a state level one, but a BPS level three. And then we're finding in a lot of our, uh, um, in our assignment process that if a neighborhood or an area has too many level threes, only certain ones will show up and it's really affecting a, a family's ability to choose a school that they'd like to choose but then in turn affecting the enroll enrollment at that school. I wish there were a way we could fix that or use better data because it sounds like, or it seems like for the BPS ranking, we're using maybe 2014 data for that ranking. Liz mm -hmm. maybe could speak to that or um, whoever. Yep, I can start and Donna can add. Um, you're right, the, the BPS, I think they're called MCAS tiers are based on school year 13, 14 data. We've definitely had some internal conversations um, about a way to make sure that parents can also see the school percentile, because then they, that would be a consistent sort of data point in addition to other data points that BPS provides that's not currently provided in the um, assignment options. It's not something that's easily findable for families. Um, and I think that would help 
sort of go to what you're saying mm -hmm. about providing consistent data. Okay. I mean, I think it's just, it's a, it's a space where we're going to need certainly more work um, because, it also, because it affects the um, assignment piece as well. Could you show us with, when we're ranking schools level one, two, three, and four, um, could you show us, it's not here in the PowerPoint, but change over time? Because it's one thing to say today, these are our level four schools or our level two or ones. But over time, um, I think it would be nice to know where schools have, where schools have ranked. Mm -hmm. And then sort of on, on, you know, how many ones, twos, threes, and fours. Mm -hmm. We can provide that. And Liza, you can fill in the exact number of years. But the, um, the only issue with that is that the state has been holding most of our elementary and middle schools harmless for the past three years. And so the only thing that's happened to an elementary or a middle school is that their status has increased if they've done better. But, it ha but there hasn't been an adjustment down by level. That's why the percentiles are so important. So okay. then maybe we see both. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, that, that would be fine. Um, so all, I think all of you know that I've been um, working with Council O'Malley on later high school start times. And of the five high schools that are currently level four, uh, four of them start at 7.30 or earlier. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've advocated for is an 8.30 start time. Um, English High School, for example, is 720, Excel 725, Madison and Brighton are 730. I just don't know as a district how we can expect high schoolers to perform at 720 in the morning. And that's the start of school. So that's, you know, they're, they're ready to go or they're supposed to be ready to go and academically perform in the classroom at that hour. I just don't see how we can set that expectation for kids when all of the research has shown for decades that kids should not, teenagers should not start school before 8.30 in the morning. So I can say um, my experience at both schools, Excel High School and also the English High School, when I arrived at English High School five years ago, the starting time was 8.30, and students arrived actually later than what they are now. So our attendance has increased, and students on time. One of the things that we did was a survey with the families um, and the community and students who wanted to play sports, because we depend on a big organization in Massachusetts, students needed to leave three classes instead of one. So therefore it was affecting also that they needed to go for a game away from uh, this area, so they needed to leave and miss three classes. So that was affecting their performance. I've, I, I just, I've never, I've coached in the district. Mm -hmm. Never have I had, even when we've played a state tournament game up in the northern, borders of Massachusetts have, has a kid had to miss three classes of school. Only when the actually class, the end in time was going to be 3.30 or 4.30. So therefore, when you push the hours down from 8.30, then the students were released at 3.30. So therefore, they were missing some classes there. It was two or three classes where they needed to go on the bus. So, so at 8.30, what time did your day end? So we start at 7.20. Yeah. And, and we end at yeah, 2.20. When you were at 8.30, what time? 8.30 was uh, 3.20. Uh, it was an hour. Yeah. And also employment. One of the things that we are doing is the CVT programs. So therefore, they need to go earlier in order to do internships and things like that. So there was a survey, and the students were the ones who requested to be a little bit earlier. So I do know that it's hard for students to get up early in the morning, also teachers. But uh, we know that the attendance has increased in participation at the school. And it started decreasing, which it was the, in the past five years. It wasn't like that. All right. I, 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 um, I can't imagine that English high school is maybe the exception to the rule. I can't imagine after decades of, of investigation, mm -hmm. both through different schools um, and school districts across the United States, mm -hmm. medical professionals, pediatricians, psychologists, psychiatrists across the United States, the research has shown that later high school start times are better for kids okay. and, and, their, um, and their academics. And um, so I just think that it's, it's something that we need to get to um, as a district and something that we need to um, ex explore uh, pretty, we, pretty thoroughly. Um, although I think it's been researched to, to all ends and we just as a district haven't moved there. Where so many of our surrounding communities and towns have. Um, I just want to switch over to the academic response teams. How many people are on each team? Oh, sorry, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Uh, there are three teams. One team that serves elementary schools. That uh, team has three staff members. One team that serves a mix of K-8 schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. That team has three staff members. And one team that's working with primarily high schools with four staff members. Each of those teams has one person whose primary area of expertise is uh, mathematics, one person whose primary area of expertise is sciences, and one person whose primary area of expertise is English language arts. In the high school team, we also have a second person whose primary, or a fourth, excuse me, person whose primary area of expertise is social studies. And that, so they're all former teachers or licensed? They are all absolutely licensed, uh, and they are all former teachers, and then each one of them also has, it varies from staff member to staff member, some of them have experience as in-building coaches, as assistant principals or headmasters, directors of instruction, coaches, teacher leaders, some sort of leadership prior experience uh, leading other educators. That's great. Thrilled to hear that. Um, I think that's all I've got for this round. Let me just go really quickly. Oh, I can come back. Council Jackson. Um, I, I also want, I want to agree with the chair. Um, one of the things that I'm actually pretty disturbed about. So, so let me un understand that. So the resources for low performing schools, these are additional resources uh, that through the mayor's budget um, have been allocated uh, to uh, district resources. This $3.134 million. Uh, I'm sorry, $135 million. Is that, is that true? That's correct. Okay. So my only issue is I'm using a BPS parent's uh, information from the uh, Kristen Johnson. Um, if you go through, so we're slashing level, f level three, level four, and level five budgets. And so the issue is, if we're talking about adding $3 million, I just went down and I don't even have my calculator in front of me, but in the first, with the first 11 schools from the Dever, Brighton, Madison, Channing, Grew, Winthrop, Dorchester Academy, Jackson Mann, McCormick, Timothy, and Urban Science, there's a $6 million cut. So as, as noted before, a couple things that happened. Um, Orchard Gardens is in my district. They got a lot of resources. They were doing really great. You took away resources, and they're not doing so great. Um, the, we're, and we're about to do the same thing to the Burke. The Burke was, uh, has, has exited out of um, uh, turnaround, and you're going to cut it $350,000. And again, I attribute this to the lack of, uh, this goes to the mayor's budget, uh, which means that it does not actually give you enough money but i don't understand so we're so we're going to cut level three four and five budgets by about 11 million and then we're going to replace that 11 million by three million how do we make progress there and what i'm speaking about are the actual uh cuts to the uh your fy18 uh dollar reductions um, at the Dever, Brighton, Madison, Channing, Grew, Winthrop. I, so I, I just I want to understand um, if we're going to address these issues around level three and level four, how does the money that you're giving actually address that when it's exponentially less than the money that's being cut at the school site level? So I think we can... Sorry. So one of the things I think we discussed in a prior hearing is this working? Okay. Um, is uh, there's a, a difference between this money here, which is money uh, allocated centrally, and Liza can speak in detail about how that three million dollars is used um, to support our high need schools, uh, and money that's allocated to schools directly for other purposes. Uh, so one of the things we've done is set aside $1.25 million to help support schools, especially our low-performing schools that have received reductions due to waived student funding and reduced enrollment. And we know that a majority of the funding that's been reduced has been reduced due to decreasing enrollment, meaning that less, fewer classes need to be offered at that school, whether they're middle school classes as, uh, at the McCormick or fewer homerooms at an elementary school. Um, and so what we're really doing with the 1.25 million in soft landing is focusing on those discretionary and supplemental services that may have 
been impacted by a loss of enrollment. But so I, Brighton's getting cut a million dollars, right? And I can I don't know a school that could survive that level of uh, extraction of funds, in particular in a year that they are going to uh, enter into uh, turnaround status. Um, at, I we ha- I had Trotter in my district. I have Trotter in my district. I have uh, Orchard Gardens in, in my district. I'm just saying this 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 is we're setting people up to fail here. This that's yeah. what's gonna ha- w- w- if by taking the that level of funding away, um, the McCormick uh, nine nine hundred and uh, nine hundred and thirty six thousand dollars. We can say there's going to be less students. But a million dollars to a school that's already in the hole, that's having a tough time, um, I, I just don't see how these additional funds external to uh, the funding needed to run the school are going to fill that hole. So how, are you, how, 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 how is a school leader to fill that, that hole um, that they've been put in based on um, what the, the 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 mayor's budget, which came over to you guys, how do you do that? Uh, how do so they operate? I can speak practically to that uh, yeah. because I've gone through those meetings with many of those school leaders, if not all. Um, so there are two different things we're looking at in those meetings. First is how is enrollment affecting the number of classrooms they need to have in the school? In many cases, if a school has lower enrollment, they need fewer classes. Now, the reduction of a teacher from that building may be painful to the school, and it is likely. It may, you know, it's some student's favorite teacher, but that teacher will end up in a different position in the district, most likely, and the school is still serving the students they have. The second question then is the discretionary or supplemental funds that the school is choosing um, to spend. That is what we've set up the $1.25 million reserve uh, to support. We're working with each school leader right now. To determine what are the most, uh, what's the best portfolio of support to provide. In addition to that, all of the money that Liza and her team work on, which she's, I'm sure, would be happy to describe, is all supplemental in nature. So it doesn't go to fund core classroom teachers or anything like that. It's really funding additional supports for those schools. Yeah, I, I just, um, and I'm not going to beleaguer the point. I, I, this, this hurts my heart, and I'm getting a little indigestion right now. Because a 0.8 increase, and this is why, and, and yesterday there was a question um, by the bud- budget office around whether or not, hey, we're adding all of this new stuff. Well, if you're not paying for what, you, what, what was the baseline before, how does the new stuff actually even ma- give us any progress if you don't pay for the baseline? And what we also do need to note, that school leaders are going to be forced to cut support staff. And in buildings like Brighton, where there's physically not enough people already in those buildings, I think, we, uh, uh, I think we're in violation of our opportunity and achievement gap. I also think, fundamentally, we are putting our young people in situations that are unsafe. Um, and uh, th- this is um, uh, disappointing that these dollars are, are in, uh, they're, they're uh, um, very, 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 uh, unimpressive relative to what is getting cut um, out of uh, level three, four, and fives. Um, and I don't believe that th- this is actually going to put us in a, in a situation um, that uh, helps these schools. And again, I'm not even attributing it to, to the school department. This shows that the mayor's budget simply does not uh, cut muster here. And a 0.8% increase in maintenance budget means that our young people are going to suffer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council McCarthy. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the marathon continues. Um, the 72% uh, graduation rate in high school, was that, is that what I heard? Four-year cohort graduation rate. Okay. And w- what is that um, in relative to other uh, cities our size? Um, so in, across Massachusetts, similar cities like Worcester, um, and Springfield, I don't have the data right in front of me, but I suspect that we're in a similar ballpark. Um, that is data that I can definitely get to you. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious because, you know, 72% of the test isn't all that hot. 
So I just I'm, you know, seventy two percent on the test. Right, like seventy two percent. I don't know if that's something we should be applauding. Well, we have seen drastic increases over the past ten year period with our four year cohort graduation rate. So I know compared to other urban districts, that's um, okay. pretty. Even solid. if I can get the stats of where we were, say five years ago. Till this now. is my, my understanding, not to cut you out, I apologize, but we're at the highest ever in the school system since I mm -hmm. went there. Yes, yes, that's 50 true. years ago. Yeah. That's my understanding. So the 72% okay. so is higher there. than when I went. So we're getting, we're getting there, doctor? <laughs> Creeping. <laughs> okay. if, I, if I may add, and if this is not helpful, just let me know, but um, as part of No Child Left Behind, the concept of the four-year cohort graduation rate and the actual careful tracking of every student and where they are and the universal student ID has meant that we have a better understanding of who's graduating now and how many transitions they're making, whether it's within schools or across school districts. And um, every urban district has seen a slow but gradual increase as a result of that. I, I, almost every, I mean, there are a few exceptions. Our, our graduation rate increase has been up there with the top 10, 20% across the nation. So even though we still have a long way to go and no one would ever say we don't, um, I think that, that the city and the school okay. district should be proud of the progress. Okay, understood. I just, okay. uh, you know, I just, for, for, you know, 72% isn't, uh, isn't tremendous from now. It depends on where we've come from. I agree. Okay. I'd, I'd like to see those numbers at some point. Absolutely. Um, Throughout every BPS hearing, I brought up the Channing School. And once again, uh, you know, out of the BPS 10 level four schools, uh, the elementary schools, 75% of them are in my district. One of them's closed, right? So Channing grew, Mattahunt. Mattahunt's no longer the Mattahunt. It's going to be something else. So we're going to figure that one out. The GRU seems to be very solid. Classrooms are, are full. I met with Channing parents the other night. And... Um, they are uh, very concerned. Uh, their, their, their trust with what's going on and what they see is very concerning. Uh, as a level four turnaround school, this is their third year. Um, it was supposed to be an art turnaround school. Uh, last year, they lost Mr. Marshall, who was, the, um, who was the music teacher. This year, they're choosing between AWC and their arts program. Um, they'd like to add a K-1 because uh, they only have a 1K. And in District 5, we need K-1 seats, as you know better than I. These are the calls I get. Uh, they lost their second, third grade, and they'd like to get that back. And when parents call me and say, I didn't get into any of the four choices I have, and I know there's room in a building, you know, this, what I'm getting from parents and what I'm getting a flavor of myself, and you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, I have no, no problem with that, is that this seems like it is you are preparing to close this school. This sounds to me like you're shrinking classes, you're dropping some, and then, the, and then a year from now it's going to be, well, the, the enrollment was down. Well, of course the enrollment's down. We don't have a K, you don't have a second K, and you've already eliminated the, uh, the third grade class, and now they're, they're going to pick between arts and AWC. So my concern with the Channing is great because I have great families who grew up in High Park, grew up in Rosendale, grew up in Mattapan, um, personal friends who have said, all I need to do, when I, when I started, when I ran for election my, uh, the first time, I knocked on everybody's door. And I can tell you, just about every family who I said hello to said, can you please just get me from K-1 to 6th, and we'll figure it out at 6th. We'll, we'll go to Latin, Latin Academy, we'll try to get into exam school, we'll go to the pilot schools, we'll go to CM, we'll go to FOM, we'll figure it out. But please, just get me to the 6th grade. There are no, there's no room in High Park for kids anymore, for elementary kids. And it just seems like the Channing School, which I love the principal, I love the teachers, I'm there all the time, it just doesn't seem like it's getting any love at all. And you've come down, so here we go. They're bringing in the big, they're bringing in the big guns. All right. Um, a couple thoughts on, on some of the comments that you've made. I think the first thing, and this is something that, that um, school leaders have raised to us throughout the projection process, is this this fear that we're using the projection process to cap or um, decrease the size of specific schools, um, e either because it's um, uh, 
strategic or because there's a, a feeling that people want us to, we want to move students away from particular schools. And that's just not something that we do. One of the things that we look at whenever we're evaluating projections is the number of students who have chosen the school in the prior year. And so um, when schools come and request that they add um, and they grow their classroom, we often look at whether or not there are kids on the wait list, whether or not there have been historically more students who want to get <clears throat> into those schools. And then if we can, we do accommodate, because again, as we said yesterday, we feel very strongly with, that we want to get families into their highest choice schools um, earlier in the process. And so um, any shrinking that we see of schools is a reflection of family choice, not sort of a, a sort of forcing of family choice. Um, to your second point about space um, in Hyde Park and throughout the city, it is certainly true that we have space constraints in our elementary schools. Um, and when we start talking about expansions of K to fives to K to sixes, or we start talking about how do we um, accommodate families in the sort of pathway that you're, you're proposing, um, and it's something that we've heard from many school communities, the challenge is that we just don't have the physical space to be able to add those classrooms in K to five, um, because there, there are the need for um, space for other purposes, either for special education classrooms, or because we want to make sure that every school has art rooms and computer rooms. And sometimes when we are adding additional bubble classrooms where we have to accommodate um, swings in enrollment, we do have to take away things like art rooms and do art on a cart or um, move to more flexible sort of specialties, which is something that in B Build BPS we highlight very clearly is not something that we want to do. So. Um, I feel like I answered a couple of the points oh, that you did. made, and I think um, you know we will be through throughout Build BPS. We're about to start a community engagement process, asking asking families and communities what um, what they want, and it will be a very community based discussion. So it won't be this abstract. What do we want across the city? You'll be able to engage with Hyde Park families on what they want for their schools in Hyde Park. Yeah, and and those are great great answers. But I, I'll I'll end. I, you, I think you just are you the you the chair now. This would be great for you. Um, you're here all the time anyway. You might as well. Um, the Channing has the space, so they have the space. But I think the fear that I'm having as a resident and listening to people, you know, stopping you and stop and shop a star market, the rumors and or accusations can kill a project, right? So if somebody wants to build a home and somebody says, oh, you know, it's going to be home for drug addicts. It, once when the horse is out of the barn, it's very difficult to get anybody to support the building of that home because they all know factually it's going to be X, Y, or Z, right? That's what's happening with the Channing. So we, we make a stride. We get a great principal. We, she changes up some teachers. They are going in the right direction, and I'm convincing families from High Park to take a shot. And I've gotten some emails. I've gotten some phone calls from families saying, thank God you called me. Thank God you told me to take a shot. And then they fire the art, te uh, the music teacher, and now the art teacher is on the ropes. And now people looking at me like, "This is this is you know." Now of course the rumor starts, you're on the path to close this school. And now I'm fighting that rumor. You're on the path to fight this school. And to be honest with you, the pegs are lining up, just like you would close a school. So that's why I brought up the chanting pretty much in every BPS hearing so far, because I'm super concerned that we have families. Putting for, it's a hot market. Everybody knows they're putting their, their house up for sale and they're, and they're leaving our neighborhoods in droves again. You know, and I know this is a process that's been happening since 1974. I know. I, you know we, we all, I, I went through it. I never, I, I, I've never lived more than 50 feet away from my dad's house, and he's still there, thank God. So you know, I know the story. I know what's happened. I know we've been doing this for a long, long time, but we can do better. I, I know we can do better. So my concerns about the Channing will continue until I can see some positive changes. And I know that, you know, the mayor's committed to the K, uh, the kindergartens. Um, if, if that commitment, uh, once when that commitment is, is settled and we're ready to go, I'd love to see another, you know, another K coming, coming our way and make sure our families aren't being bussed out across the city. So I appreciate your answer and I appreciate you. And I wasn't trying to be flip about the 72%. So I know you got your, no, no, you got your backup, which is fine, because yeah. that means you care. Like, if you don't get, if you didn't get your backup, I'd be like a little bit like, nah. I also wanted to make a note. Thank you for the question, by the way. Yep. Um, I just didn't understand when you said the test. So 
but yeah. thank you for the apology no, no, as I, well. On, um, honest to God, if you didn't if you didn't come back at me, I would be like, maybe she doesn't really care that much. But you no, do. I, I do, and I that. think we we want all of our students to graduate within four years, but we also have um, a five year um, graduation cohort rate that we track as yeah. well. Because if we don't capture them within the four year period, it's very important that we capture them that fifth year, and that right. rate is um, seventy six percent. Sure, I've been working with high schoolers for about. 28 years now, so I know they're all over the map and they're tough to kind of get into a group, but uh, thank you for that effort. Right on time, doctor. <laughs> thank you, uh, Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, on the, I don't know what page it is, but resources for low-performing school, that's for all, that's for all of these, all of these level, level three and level four, that's that split. So across resources below Yes. Yes, I have it on the screen for you. That one? So that so all our underperforming schools, that's just their resources to split. Um no, different different lines in that um total are allocated for certain things. So for instance, the all resources including grant funds the next line up for that state grants to support level three schools the four hundred and fifty thousand dollars yeah there are 20 specific schools that receive grant funded activities from that that specific line so that that so that 450 is cut 20 ways but not equally like the so the lowest um the money is divided in is allocated between schools that are in the bottom five percent mm -hmm. Um, those schools are all getting two days monitoring site visits. That's the bulk of those funds. Yeah. Additionally, uh, several level three schools are getting acceleration academies out of those funds and other level three schools applied to us for what we called mini grants of up to $10,000 that they used in specific ways at their school. So it is not an equal, just divide 450,000 by 20 and they each get the same amount. Yeah, I understand that, but it's but it's so under uh, s support to level four schools through three hundred fifty eight thousand. That that goes, that split that however many ways. Not all the same, but it's basically that's the full pot for all the schools. Okay, that's correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, what are what are the admission schools like? So so you have exam schools, open enrollment, and admission. Like, how do you get into an admission school? So these are uh, mainly pilot schools that were open uh, for specific programs. Yeah. So therefore, they have students who have to apply. Yeah. Uh, and some of them go to an uh, audition. And so uh, like, so like the, the the arts academy would be an audition, uh, an audition. The other ones would be an interview. Interview, uh, some writing samples, some different perspectives. So all of them have carved in their uh, bylaws, I would say, uh, the admissions policy. Okay. So they don't have the same admissions policy, but they do have a policy to get admitted into the school. So, so if if a kid wants to go to to the Edward M. Kennedy Health Career, he applies to it or she applies to it, and then there's an interview process. That's the Horace Mann Charter School. Right. So that's a different. There, some of the schools on here are pilots, and some are Horace Mann Charters. And so but, the but, Horace Mann. But, but they the, path, have, the pathway is the same. It would be you would apply, and then you have to go and. Charters interview. are a lottery. Charters are a lottery. Right. So okay. that would be uh, Boston Green Academy and the Edwards that they will apply and they go through a yeah, lottery process. The other ones are by admissions and they have in their bylaws the process that students apply for, families apply for. Okay. Okay. Um, can we talk about vocational uh, vocation <laughs> schools a little bit? I think, was it Michelle? Was your name Michelle? Yes. Hi, Michelle. Can you talk a little bit about um, vocation and technical education, wherever you want to start? Like, what, what, what's our thought here in BPS? Where are we now? Where do we see ourselves in four years, five years, ten years? Is it, is it, um, is it you know, we have, we have Madison Park, you have carpentry, electrical, and those sort of things we normally think of for, for technical. Do they all stay there, or, or um, like how are they connected to the outside world? Just give me your overview, if you would. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, I think that, uh, and first I'll say that I came on board with BPS in August, 
And so part of my onboarding process has been, um, you know, certainly assessing all of the programs throughout the district. This past week, we had a Department of Education coordinated program review for career and technical education. So we will be getting some feedback um, from the department within the next um, uh, two months or so, and we'll be using that feedback as well uh, in, to kind of do an evaluation of the quality and putting forward a strategic plan moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, in brief conversations um, that we have had um, in terms of what that strategic plan will look like moving forward, one of the things we want to do is maximize many opportunities for students. So currently we have 20 unique programs in the district. We have 35 programs altogether, but you can see that are from considered the, technical. Yes, that are official career and technical education programs. We report those uh, students to the state as CTE students. So we have 20 um, unique programs in the district. Is and that what's on the left side here? Those are the. Is that what you're talking about? Well, in this in this slide. Sure. Here. Yeah, that reflects all of the programs. So okay. all together, there are um, going to be about 40 programs next year. But this current school year, we have about 35, but 20 of them are unique. That means that we have about 15 that are duplicate programs. So you probably will notice we have quite a few design and visual communications programs, quite a few computer science programs. Mm -hmm. We want to um, make sure that we're providing unique opportunities to students. I had mentioned before about the non-resident student tuition process. Students do have the ability to go to other vocational schools for programs that we do not currently offer. So we want to take a look at some of those um, offerings that we do not have that exist in career and technical education, the state, and um, maybe vet some of those programs as can, can, new can developing I stop, can programs. I stop? Can you tell me a couple of the programs that, that, that kids are going to other schools for? Like, do you know any off the top of your head? Yep, absolutely. Um, the majority of the students who are um, seeking <laughs> non-resident tuition are going to the agricultural schools. Oh, the the uh, the Norfolk the Norfolk um, Aggie. Yes, and and that's the largest um, percentage. We also have uh, some students who are going to Minuteman um, High School. Minuteman Regional, and what are they going out there for? Um, it's a variety of programs. Um, they're mostly upperclassmen because the department changed the regulations around the non-resident student tuition process in 2015. And when they changed those regulations, um, they stated that we have the ability to keep students in-house um, at our Chapter 74 exploratories and not um, approve students to go to um, area regional vocational high schools for exploratory if we offer it here, which we do. What, is it, what, do, they, what do you mean exploratory? What is like yep. to go see what they want to do? Yep, and, and typically what happens in grade nine is that students go through what we call an exploratory experience where they get experiences in all the vocational programs that the school offers. So Madison Park, you know, for example, the um, first half of the year, students are exploring all of the different shops and then they get to um, select those that they want to be considered for admissions, and then the school makes the, the admissions process, and then in the second half of the year, they go directly into the shop. But it's best practice to have the students have actual activities and experiences in those shops so they can make good decisions as well as their families on which ones they should select. Yeah. So currently in the regulations, we have the ability n to um, not allow students to leave for exploratory and to direct them to our own exploratories. The regulations are very clear, though, that students do have the ability to go to agricultural schools because it's specialized programming that is not... But then they need to get into those programs, too. Do they, like... Absolutely. Do, do, like, so how, do, how does a kid that wants to go to Norfolk Aggie say, how do they just get in there? Don't they have a waiting list or wherever else there would be an Aggie yes. program? Yes, that's another part of the process that the student applies to the school he's seeking or she's seeking admission, has to go through all of the admissions 
process just like any other student. And um, so there's a chance that, you know, they may not get in yeah. based on their admissions criteria. So, so back to Minutemen, the upperclassmen, what, what are the, the kids, choo- what, are, what are they choosing to go to Minuteman for if we're, if we're paying for it? Are, are there any specifics like I had heard sheet metal before or, or whatever it was, some sort of angle that was getting them to Blue Hills Regional or, or to, to Minuteman? What are the shops that they're choosing that, that allows them to go out there, if you know what they are? There, um, there's, I mean, there's a couple of shops, and, and you're right in terms of um, if we have the program in house, then that's another reason that we do not have to allow, you know, the student to to go to another um, school. And, and Madison Park certainly has quite a few programs. Um, engineering was one of the programs that we saw. Um, environmental science, is telecommunications. Off the top of my head, it was a variety. There wasn't anything in particular that really no. stood out. Um, there was kind of a, a, a wide variety of programs. So, but if engineering is here under John D. O'Brien, can we direct a kid towards the, the O'Brien? They we, have to test into the O'Brien too, though, correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Um, we can't at this time because, as you notice, the O'Brien is under the non-Chapter 74 column, mm-hmm. and so the um, the out-of-district admissions process is only about Chapter 74 okay. programs. Okay. So the state does not recognize um, the, the non-Chapter 74 as, as an option in the out-of-district process. So certainly, if um, if that were to become a Chapter seventy four, then we could direct students to that in the future. Okay. Um. In in as far as am I okay, Madam Chair? Okay. Thank you. Um. And so, like, how connected are we with groups that are going to come in? And you know, so again, I'm back at plumbing, electrical, carpentry. Uh, are the Carpenters Union, is there a presence over there at Madison Park? Plumbers Union, do they have a presence there? Or the electricians, do they have a presence there? Yes, absolutely. Um, all of the programs that you see listed have something called a program advisory committee, and they meet twice yearly, and that includes members of industry as well as apprenticeship programs, labor organizations. And um, so they do have connections, and many of them do presentations at the school yearly to, um, you know, give notice to the students and families on what those um, opportunities are for apprenticeships with the area unions. Okay. And, and my, last, my last bit here is that in, uh, in the budget overview, I don't know if it was Dr. Chang or somebody was mentioning about um, one week one week hands on, one week in the school. Where, where is that going? Is that going on at Madison Park? Or is that going on, like it in in all of our schools? Where is that going on? And, and how long has it been going on? And is that something that we're going to continue to do? Yes, Madison Park does have that rotating um, schedule. They are really the only school that has that schedule. Um, all the other schools operate on on a fairly traditional high school schedule. Um, it allows for extra time on learning within the vocational program. Uh, it allows for students, in, as they become upperclassmen, to have opportunities for internships and co-op um, education because their vocational time is, is extended. Um, so I think it is a good system and seems to be working at Madison. Okay, and last question is, approximately how many, how many kids are doing the the out of district tuition for vocation approximately yep. so um for school year 16 17 we have about 45 students and that's a million dollars i don't Each, know where I... yes that's that was zara uh, allotted budget and and it it kind of changes throughout the the school year um, Did I have that right? It was yes, a million for. It, it is a million. Um, each of the school's tui- tuitions are approximately twenty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So if you have forty-five students times twenty thousand dollars. Now per it's a math class <laughs> per student. Yeah, we're roughly about nine hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Campbell. <laughs> And thank you, Councillor Asabi George, uh, and thank you guys uh, for being here today. Um, I apologize if I repeat some questions that have already been asked. I had sort of a crisis, so I apologize in advance. Um, just going back to the number of uh, level threes, level fours, level fives in the district, um, do we have those numbers? We do. Um, the district you. currently in school year 16 17 has 10 level four schools. Uh, 53 level three schools and two level five schools. Uh, which schools are the level fives? The Dever and Up Academy Holland. Exactly. Okay. Um, and is there sort of any? Uh, a document or, or something that looks at sort of pulls that apart a little bit. So, for example, the the 53 level three schools determining which ones might be on their way to becoming a level two, um, which ones haven't really moved, uh, which ones are kind of moving in the direction of becoming a level four. So I'm going to start with your last part of what you just said. Okay. Um, these 26 schools are in the bottom 10% of like schools statewide. Mm -hmm. So these are the ones we are most concerned about in terms of potential move to level four. Um, these are all level threes that may move to level four. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Sort of the lower they are, the more in danger they are. Um, but at the same time, and we did not actually talk about this earlier, as the state looks at a variety of data points for schools to make the determination on accountability level, there is an element of the commissioner's discretion. So there is not in the current state accountability system like a specific percentile that if you hit this, you're automatically mm -hmm. level four. It's not like if you're in the sixth percentile, you're fine, but the fifth, you're not. Um, so there is some uh, discretion by the commissioner at the state level to determine. So it's not to say, for instance, you know, the Chittick could be one, but the Blackstone couldn't because the Blackstone's a three and the Chittick's a two, if that makes sense. Um, so there, it's not a, a sort of specific formula in that way, but yes, these are our lowest performing um, schools that are not already level four or five schools. And then the other level threes, we're more hopeful that either there, we've seen some improvement um, or they're on their way to moving to level two or. There's, there's been mo movement in a positive direction, I'm assuming. Um, so there, we definitely have many level four schools. About half of our level three schools are, are um, in the 11th through 20th percentiles. Um, so we have about half our schools that are in that bottom 10% and half are higher than that. Um, have we um, mapped where these level threes, fours, and fives are? You mean geographically? Uh, we do not have a map of that. That's a good question. We should do that. Um, I know where some of them are in my district, but I'd be curious to sort of see where the level one, twos, threes, fours, and fives map in terms of where they are located in the city of Boston. I think it informs some of the conversation we had about um, home base and the assignment process and the frustration that some parents and yeah, students have. It will. Um, I was very excited to see in this budget that reserve amount um, dedicated to supporting level threes, fours, and five schools. Um, curious to know, this. I, I think I asked this and, and actually decided to reserve these questions for this particular hearing, but mentioned it in the overview. Of that $1.25 million, um, where that money is sort of going to, or how it's being used, um, that's that sort of the reserve amount in addition to the, the $15 million I think first we start with $15 million that are for these level three, fours, and five. But in addition to that, this budget proposes yeah. $1.25 million. That's cool. um, is there a breakdown as to where that funding is? Or was this, Eleanor might have actually answered this. I, I can give, I can, it's a pretty quick answer. So I can, okay. I can do it again and you can ask, ask follow up questions <laughs> if you want. Um, so, All my questions are running together. It's no, crazy. It's, we're happy to talk about it. So. <laughs> Um, we don't have a final distribution list. I think list that's what it yet. was. Okay. Um, and part of the challenge is we're still finishing up our turnaround planning process for our level four schools. And we want to get okay. that finalized because, as Eleanor mentioned, we're prioritizing those schools in level four. Um, so once we've got that prioritized and final, and I think those applications are due fairly soon, so 
we should be done fairly soon. Um, we'll then see, make decisions about how we're balancing what's going to support the level fours versus our high need level three schools. Mm -hmm. Um, all of those high need level three schools have, because they don't go through a turnaround planning process, we ask them each to submit just a short form that describe if they got additional resources at a variety of different levels, what might what they do with those resources. Um, and the instructional superintendents are reviewing those actually this week so that we can make final decisions about how to allocate that money for us. Who's deciding um, how that money will be, that 1.25 will be used? Is it the district saying, Looking at your school, we think you need to do a better job with A, B, and C when, when attempting to uh, turn around your school, or is it the school coming to the district and saying, we need to do this to turn around our school? I would say it's starting with the school coming to the district, but there okay. is a review by the instructional superintendents. Okay. I think um, the school coming to the district, they would probably put on the table 25, mm -hmm. 30, 40 million dollars of stuff they wanted to do. Um, as we're looking at the 1.25 million we have, uh, they're thinking about a variety of different options to provide good data points for the instructional superintendents to make a decision. The other thing that we're providing is just the financial details that you see here about um, the size of changes going on at every school and how enrollment is changing as well. And one of the things the instructional superintendents are doing is working with each uh, principal and headmaster to try and get a real idea of how much was your discretionary budget actually impacted? Because there may be two schools that on paper, their cut looked exactly the same, but in practice at one school, it really affected their discretionary budget because they weren't able to close classrooms at another school. What it really meant was they have one fewer classroom next year, and actually besides that, their, their school looked exactly the same. And we want to focus those resources in on that first school where they're losing discretionary or supportive services going across their students versus the second school where um, the only change may be that a classroom has closed down because there weren't any students to attend that class. Okay. Um, are, is there any parent or student involvement in this process? So what I mean by that is obviously the school leader, it's easy to go to the school leader and say, what do you need for your school to turn around your school? Um, but is there any sort of, has there been any convening for these particularly level fours or level threes that are in danger of parents and students about what they think their school needs yeah. and thus can inform how we give out that 1.25 million? I only ask because when we look at the Mattahunt, are you looking at me? Oh. When we look at the man, don't look at me. <laughs> Thank you, Council Zero. <laughs> when we look at Wasn't the, the evil eye, we it are, was the high I eye. love him. <laughs> we, I was, he, it was the high look, and we're all in this together. Um, when you look at the Madahun, for example, one of the things that was very frustrating about that, just the whole process, was how many parents had no idea that their school was a level four, had no idea how long their school was labeled a level four, didn't know what a level four meant, couldn't define it. Um, and then, of course, had to respond to the district's um, plan of, well, we need to do me immediate change, otherwise we may lose this school. And so I'm curious, who was doing um, that sort of proactive outreach to parents now for these schools before we go in and say, um, we're going to do this with your school um, we're going to do this with your school, and they feel as though they were never part of the process. So I can speak to the level threes, and what I say actually applies to the level fours as well, but the level fours also get additional uh, support beyond that that Liza can speak to. Um, for the level threes, uh, the primary mechanism through the budget process for them to engage stakeholder input is through the school site council. So uh, for um, elementaries, that's just parents and teachers. At the secondary, at the high schools, that includes student representatives as well. Um, and that process actually started in January as they were going through their budget process. Every school site council reviews the budget along with the principal and has an opportunity to provide uh, feedback to the district on their budget and things they want to see different. I know then, um, as we've asked each school leader to come back, a number of them have just taken um, elements from their school site council's letter and use that to bring it back. I know a couple of schools that actually had special school site council meetings to talk about the form and what they wanted to put on the form. 
Um, and then there's something separate for the level fours that Liza can quickly describe. Um, thank you. So uh, in the level four process, when a school is designated level four, uh, the district has done a good job of reaching out to families, making sure they know about the designation. And then there's a formal group called the local stakeholder group that meets that has uh, family representation on it. But then the meetings are also open. So sometimes families also attend that makes recommendations to Dr. Chang about what they feel should be in the turnaround plans. So for instance, Brighton and Excel both had local stakeholder groups this fall that met over the course of 45 days, I believe five or six times, um, and made recommendations to Dr. Chang about those schools' turnaround plans. And so the district has done that well for many years. What we've done less well is once a school is already in level four, continuing that communication with families. How's the school doing in the second year, the third year, et cetera? Um, and so we heard that loud and clear through the Mattahunt process in the fall. And so this spring, we've been piloting those type of um, sort of progress update family meetings. And we've had the first two, one with Channing families um, that occurred in April and Winthrop families that occurred at the end of last week. Um, to really start talking with families. Mm. How are we doing now? Not just sort of we've been designated and then sort of letting the three years pass and not having that type of communication. So we're piloting those meetings this spring with the goal that starting next year in the fall around designation time, which usually is in you know late September when the, the test data come back from the previous spring, we would give families that kind of update and say, here's what we've learned, right? Here's what's been working. Here's how we've done on our performance. Here's how we've done on our growth. Here are the strategies the school is doing. And how can you really be involved um, in supporting your child's learning at home, things you can get involved in at the school. Um, so that's an area where we're growing, um, and we're piloting that this spring. And I, I will say, um, this, is, this is great. I mean, I think one of the challenges is, and we have that challenge even at Selected's reaching our constituents, is how do you engage with parents who don't participate in the school site council. And there's a lot of parents who do not know what they do or frankly, maybe don't even care, um, but who are not engaged in the process anyway, who speak a different language. Um, I think Mattahunt is still a great example of, there's so many things to learn out of yep. the Mattahunt, particularly when we, you know, the district said, we're going to proactively reach out to every family and how challenging it was to track those families down, to find them at home. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously this could be a whole department that just focuses on that. Um, so I'm always thinking about how we can do better, but this is very helpful. Well, in some of the conversations we've been having, and we have had a very strong partnership with our school support team and the Office of Engagement on this, is what are the events that families do go to at the school, whether it's sporting events, a spring barbecue, like any of those kind of events mm -hmm. where families would be. Um, which may get more attendance, and how can we weave this kind of information into those while they're already at the school, instead of just having a separate, you know, progress night that may be intimidating for some families, and trying to just make it something that's more accessible to more people, because you're right, we don't want it to be just the same, you know, six families that go to the student parent council, school parent council. Or school and I think council. it's something we have to invest in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, most of the, uh, many school leaders I talk to say, you know, they use that distinction of there are families that are engaged, but not families that are involved. Um, and they do know families that want to be involved, maybe don't know how to be involved. Mm -hmm. Some don't feel so welcoming to some of their schools for whatever reason. Um, but you know, how do we invest in that in a formal way, in a proactive way, um, to really get our parents to be involved? And then, of course, um, not to sort of it to be a blow up when the district has to make some really tough decisions. So I, I'll move on, but I cool. just wanted to hear more about that. Can I add one more yes. point since Monica Roberts is not Hi, Monica, here? Yes. Um, the Office of Engagement has in their strategic implementation plan work um, a commitment this year to building out additional strategies. And we're talking now about what the, um, what the work plan will look like for next year. And this is an area where they plan to double down. And I think that um, if you know through your own work or if you know other people who have some suggestions and advice that that office would be very, very, very open to talking with anyone because we recognize as we came around to the end of the enrollment period that in fact, we, they, they ended up going door to door and, and actually yeah. to meet, to meet yep. the people who had not yet selected a school. 
and that what we've learned we too have learned a lot mm -hmm. of lessons from this and so it is a high priority for the office of engagement to find better ways to make these connections around what would be the enticement for that parent to be engaged or simply just how do we get more information to more people who can't or don't have the time to be engaged absolutely thank you um i just have two more questions one is after schools come out of turnaround mm -hmm. Um, you know, Orchard Gardens, all the schools that, that come out, one of their biggest complaints is, or the Trotter School uh, or, or others, um, is once they sort of come out, how the resources quickly stop. There's not a um, downward slope or even sort of a transition plan mm -hmm. to sustainability. So I'm curious to hear about schools that come out of turnaround that do the hard work of really um, transforming their schools to deliver better outcomes. Um, how do we then do a better job supporting them? Um, and some of this may be on the state side, um, but how do we do a better job supporting those schools so that they have um, they can sustain those results forever? Whereas we're we're doing all this work, we're investing all this, and then we're looking at Orchard Gardens or other schools literally going back um, in the opposite direction of where yeah. we want them to go. So. Um, I think there's a, a couple of different things, but one thing I know um, that I definitely personally appreciate about the superintendent and his team when they transitioned in was one of the things they identified pretty early on was that problem, and we have a plan in place to address that. Um, so step one of that plan is something called turnaround transition funding. Uh, so this is designed to do two things. One is maintain level of funding as a school stays in turnaround potentially beyond the end of their school replacement grant funding. So even in the best case scenario, a school enters turnaround, they have three years of school replacement grant funding, let's say they exit turnaround right away, that they don't find out until the fall mm -hmm. of the fourth year, whether or not they've actually exited, and the funding is already gone. So one of the things that the district is planning to do as a part of the turnaround transition funding is say, as long as in the budget year we're in, well, as we're budgeting, if you're still a level four, the district is committed to providing the funds equivalent to the school redesign grant if that grant is in. For, so, for how long? As long as they stay a level four, it stays in uh, at 100%. If that school then were to exit. Right. So we have two schools this year, the Channing and the Winthrop. They're in their last year of their school redesign grant. We don't find out until the fall whether or not they're exiting. Um, for next year, regardless of what happens, they stay at 100% of the funding level. If, and hopefully they do, exit in the mm -hmm. fall, then for the next budget cycle, they keep 80% of that discretionary funding as they begin to exit and sort of consolidate outcomes and, you know, in what would be year five. Then, right? And they then keep that 80% funding for an additional year once yeah. they exit? And then uh, the year after that, it goes down to about 50%. And then the year after that, it goes down to 30%. And the year after that, it would be zero. Um, and in addition to that, the district actually supports the extended learning time that the school got through turnaround. Um, uh, exactly how that works varies by school and the mechanism mm -hmm. by which they exit. Yep. Similar to the other pilot innovations, the conversation we had yeah. yesterday. <laughs> um, right. So ex uh, the financial commitment is different per school, but what it feels like to the school is the same, which is I extended my hours through my turnaround plan, that will continue. Um, what, is this happening now? It is, so the last slide in your packet, which mm -hmm. is on the screen, um, shows the level four schools receiving turnaround transition funds this year and next fiscal year. Um, so you'll see right now that the English and Mattahunt uh, their school redesign grants concluded last school year. Um, and neither of those two schools exited level four status in school year 16, 17. So the amounts you see for them in fiscal year 17 are district funds. So for the English, 533,000 and Mattahunt, 600,000. Those were the amounts they received yearly in the school redesign grant. Mm -hmm. But they received those dollars this year in district funds because the SRG had concluded, the grant had concluded. But we're not able to do this for every school. We are not going back and retroactively doing it for schools that came mm -hmm. out before. What we're trying to do is address proactively moving forward 
the fact that what came, what's come up a couple of mm-hmm. times now is that it's a steep it's a steep drop off when the funding just disappears right, right at the point in in I met, mentioned this before so you, um, but it, they're generally speaking it really takes about five years plus for turnaround to consolidate and the state has a three year timeline so right um, when when Dr Chang got here we all looked at everything and one of the strong recommendations was to figure out the step down. David is mentioning the piece that is also tremendously important too. A lot of our schools don't exit at the end of the third year. And so keeping those resources intact so the school can continue to improve enough to exit is also a necessary component of it. So that's all, that part is all going on now. And we wait, we're looking forward to a school exiting to see the benefit of the, the 80. But actually just one correction, we actually are doing it retroactively. Oh, we did? Yeah, yeah. Um, this year. So we went back and, you know, now that the plan's formally in place, we went back and reviewed. It turns out the only school that's eligible that was exited recently um, was the Burke. And so the Burke did get uh, additional oh, support. Uh, the next year is the Burke's 30% year. Mm-hmm. So they got a little bit more money. Um, it's never. It's not as much money as it seems because a lot of the money goes to pay for ELT, and we pay for that regardless of the. Um, one of the things we don't necessarily see, um, in this presentation, and we can come back, and do this is is retroactively the schools that have exited turnaround, how the district has continued to provide support for them to have extended school days, um, and we can perhaps work that up and bring it back at a later date. Um, but so for a school like the Burke or um, or the gardens or uh, the trotter or the black zone yeah, uh, yeah the primary continuing support that will continue forever at those schools is in-kind support in terms of the payments that we make to teachers to continue their extended day. thank you if something comes up i just at least want to give my colleagues a question thank um you. councilor zakum no quick go ahead yeah. Councilor yeah, thank you you guys Councilor Zakum um <laughs> is in attendance uh councilor asabi jewett Thank you, um, and this will this will be my last round of hit my wall. Um, can you, do we have, have we identified the differences between what are one and two schools and three, four, and five schools? Like, what are the key findings? Is it um, you know, is it partnerships? Is it neighborhood resources? Is it demographics? Is it um, grade configuration? More kids live in the neighborhood, so they're you're shaking your heads. So I'm hoping you have that answer. I'm getting back to just the slide that shows level ones, twos, and threes. Um, so the, we know the state of Massachusetts has done research on the first cohort of level four schools was designated in 2010. Um, and what the state decided to do was track those schools during the three years of their turnaround plan. So they were the first sort of time the state had done that. Um, and found pretty quickly within that first year, and then it sort of grew over time, there were four very key practices these schools were implementing that seemed to lead to rapid achievement gains, and the schools that were not were either sort of not improving or really rapidly declining during level four status. Um, And those practices we also see in uh, very strong forms, although they look a little bit different, in the higher performing schools. So the first is about leadership, shared responsibility and professional collaboration. Um, And just for shorthand purposes, it's sort of how the adults work together at the school. It's about things like, you know, are there opportunities for a lot of different types of leadership at the school? How are the different teams working together? How are the adults using their time? Um, And does really every adult in the building take ownership for every student in the building? Not just like, oh, those are David's students, I don't need to worry about them, but we all care about all of our students. So that was really the first practice they found that seemed to be a key lever. The second one was all about intentional practices for improving instruction. Um, you know, the, the work to provide high quality instruction is a lot of work. It is not magic. It's a lot of hours. It's professional development. It is looking at data, sort of all those practices that make for high quality teaching in every classroom. The third is about um, student specific supports and ensuring all students are getting a high quality education regardless of their needs. So that could be, that's about using data to really figure out what each student need and what groups of students need to be successful in the classroom. That includes our English language learners, our students with disabilities, 
are overage undercredited students, sort of any group of students, what supports they need to be successful at school. Um, and the fourth practice that really undergirded all of it was what is the school's culture and climate? Is it, a, is it a climate of high expectations? Is it one where it is a joy to be in the learning environment? Are there good relationships between adults, between students, and between students and adults? Sort of how are families involved? How's the community involved? Sort of what's it like to be in that space? And is it a great place to work and learn? So all four of those practices are things we would see in both sort of high performing schools and also schools that start low performing and are making those rapid gains. There has to be though within like what what leads to those four things mm -hmm. are other pieces that we can actually measure. So I imagine, and we talked in an earlier session about excellence for all and advanced work, schools that have those programs probably are at a higher level of success, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. I'm just guessing. Schools that have um, sensical grade configurations because kids are going to stay there for the longer haul. Parents have a longer time to be engaged or it makes more sense because they're not sort of there temporarily and then moving off to the next school. So kids that, you know, schools that have fewer kids um, with transition. So when we talk about a kid that's in one building for a long period of time as opposed to three or four different schools, um, but also, you know, schools that, you know, definitely aren't capacity schools right? Because we see that that sort of creates so much uncertainty for families. And um, schools with strong partnerships and neighborhood resources or local resources. And can we measure that at all? Um, so most of the things you mentioned when you were talking, I was thinking about sort of what of those four term yeah, practices they, they would yeah, go they in for sure. Yeah, they fill into those buckets. But but you're right, they're a metric of those things. Right. Yes, agree. Um, uh, yes, we do look at those things, certainly. I mean, I know at the level four, in the level four schools, they have a variety of um, goals and benchmarks, both in their turnaround plans and in their um, school redesign grant applications that get to those more micro level like you're describing. So for instance, um, they, there's their measurable annual goals is what it's called in the turnaround plan. And one of the measurable annual goals is about sort of how the adults feel about how it is to work in the school. So we use survey data from those annual monitoring site visits where adults report, you know, I feel that um, teachers in this building hold all students to high expectations, for instance. So yes, we do look at, we look at survey data, we look at student performance data, we look at um, culture data, including adult culture, like teacher attendance, student attendance, um, disciplinary data, all of those things to see how schools are doing. Now, on the flip side, and I think, you know, I sort of, I feel that, that supports my belief that that's what measures, a, creates a one and two school. But then I think of East Boston High, where I used to work, and it has all of those components, yet we still, the school still struggles to, to ever reach a level one or a level two, or a two, never mind a one, um, because there are some other sort of circumstances that are outside of our control. Yep. How do we... How do we take control of things we can't control? I mean, is that DESI? Is that advocating to the Department of Ed to, to say, listen, it's not fair to measure us by these markers or these indicators because we can never get control of them? What's one example of an um, And we have a large... Um, like a SIFE population, I know at East Boston High, so, groups groups of kids that have had you know significant in. gaps in education. They come to the United States, they're learning English, and they quite clearly might say to a teacher, to an administrator, "I really just want to work on my English skills." And then I can't be 18 and put in a ELL one group mm -hmm. and think that I'm going to be here for four years. It's just not going to happen. I, mean, I, I don't know if there's, yeah. there's not really an answer to it. I, I think it's just a challenge that we face as a district. And I think that the challenge that we are trying to face when you look at the slide 13, that we actually divide the schools by, you know, the exam schools, admissions, open enrollment. What are the conditions on schools that we are putting as a district and how we can support them? Because that means they need a tailored kind of uh, support. So that's what we are dividing them. What is making that profile of school that can make it or break it in a way? So absolutely, yes, looking at the size number, size looking at the number of uh, special education students, non-diploma bound versus diploma bound, 
So that is the work that we are doing, trying to dissect what is the it, knowing that no schools are the same. So by creating that profile, then we can go and say, if we assign all so many SIFE students to a school that would make 50%, then what are we doing to support that school? Right. So we are in the beginning of those conversations, and you are right. What is the thing that makes a school successful or not? And that is the part that we are doing into the strategic component, not to say all oh, the schools will get, receive the same support. It doesn't work that way. Right. And so they don't need the same support. Correct. And looking at East Boston, it's also what is going on in the neighborhood? What is going on with the gangs? So therefore, how do we put, deploy all the resources that is not just academic, but it's also to keep it safe? So well, I think I did make a note on this uh, 13, the schools that are serving special populations. These are all schools and programs that are acclaimed. And you know, as a district, we need more of this type of programming yes. to support our kids. We, we agree. And um, the other resource that I think has been um, a big support, at least um, for Dr. Chang and myself, there is a group of, there, of urban superintendents that regularly convene once a month. And um, many of those individuals that are the superintendents um, of those districts have the same question that you have. And together, we're looking at all kinds of options and opportunities, which would which they presented a number of them during the preparation of the plan for submission to the federal government about what ESSA, the new um, No Child Left Behind, is going to look like. Some of them made it in, some of them didn't. But there is a lot of statewide advocacy, largely in the urban superintendents um, uh, world, around these exact questions that you're asking. because urban struggling urban schools are all struggling but they are all struggling many of them are struggling for different reasons mm -hmm. and that's what you're asking how do we bring to bear the specific responses needed to the individual needs at each school which is what has led to us trying to divide out the schools and think about this subgroup by what each of those individual schools is going to need to leverage itself into um higher performance. Well, I think kids. it would also lead itself to having a, a more truer understanding of our graduation rate. Yes. Because we can say on paper it's 72 percent, but we know for so many of our kids they're not going to graduate and that's held against us. So 72, what's the real number for 72 percent? Because I know at East Boston High okay. our graduation rate is low. Right. But in reality, or I guess not reality, but if we were to look sort of at the the better numbers or the truer numbers to what our graduation rate is, it's much higher because there's so many kids that will never graduate. We know that from day one, but that number is held against us as they become part of that cohort forever and ever. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be interesting to at least be able to talk um, about what that truer number is for graduation rates. I do on the um, on slide um, on slide twelve where it has the AP and the graduation rate. Do we track at all the graduate uh, the college graduation rate of our kids? So we've got how many kids are showing up to school uh, mm -hmm. or showing up to graduation within that 16-month period, but what's the actual college graduation rate? Yes, we have an extensive um, process to track longitudinally the persistence and completion rates of our students. Our most recent data is on um, the class of 2009 because we track it across a six and seven year mm -hmm. period. And we are at 51.3% um, right now for um, students who enter into college within um, the first 12 months, completing at a 51.2% three percent rate over six years is that bachelor's program Are we measuring associates or that is um bachelor's um as well as associates and some certificates and then do we what's that compared to nationally um nationally um the college completion rate um for similar urban districts is around 48 okay, percent so we're we're at the national level mm -hmm. of the graduation or the other number so we're getting mm -hmm. way above it. That's great. Um, and then I think, Michelle, my last questions are about the um, vocational stuff. I'm sorry. My vocabulary is also declining as the day goes. <laughs> the stuff. Um, are we, so with the, the kids that are leaving our district, the 45 or so kids, are we, um, you know, the, the, I, I, I understand that they have to request to enter a program that we don't offer. Are they graduating from the program that they're requesting 
admittance to? Are we checking what they're actually graduating with? I would say for the most part they are. We get a yearly update on their status. So um, we know what programs that they persist in, and we can see them across the four years of high school. Um, so the majority of the students do stay and graduate from, from that vocational program. And in agriculture? Yeah, the, the agricultural schools have a, a lot of different programs. Um, animal science is, is very okay. yeah, popular with students this year. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of offerings there. So it's not just kind of a, you know, traditional agriculture. Okay. And then are we, um, what are the demographics of those kids that are leaving? Um, we don't have a, uh, a clear tracking of all the demographics. They come from every part of the city. Um, you know, they, they attend all different types of schools. Um, the application is uh, fairly basic. Uh, we check their residency in Boston. That's one of the, the you know, the what requirements. What if they move while they're? Can... Yep, and, and of course that, that does happen. So we do get an update. Um, it is a, uh, a process through um, SIMS reporting to the state that the receiving school has to report their current address um, as part of their student enrollment data. So we will get that update if a student um, leaves the vocational school or if they um, move out of the Boston district. And then you didn't include, um, and because it was one of the programs I, I taught, you didn't include entrepreneurship. Are we not offering that anymore in our schools? We are not offering entrepreneurship as a standalone program. Um, that was at East Boston High School? It was at East Boston yeah. High, but it's also, was at, I think English had a program, Charlestown has a program. Mm -hmm. but just Let not. Me, so the difference yep. is between the programs that we offer in the program studies and then the ones that we receive funding for. Okay. So that was... So because it didn't receive Perkins money. Exactly. It okay. wasn't part of the program. But yeah, there are more wonderful programs that they're offering the schools. It's just that, uh, and here's just the CVTs or non-chapter 74. But yeah. And then do these, the staff that, especially the duplicate programs or the duplicate programs in particular, do they, the staff at the various schools have an opportunity to connect and discuss best practices? Because oftentimes it's one teacher that teaches the one program. So do they have an opportunity to collaborate with, across schools? We are beginning to um, put together opportunities for the, the staff. Um, for example, we just, you mentioned design. We just started a design curriculum team. Um, bringing a group of uh, the design and visual communications teachers together to um, work on curriculum and plan lessons and do professional development to their colleagues. So that is something that we definitely intend to expand. That's great. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Councilor Zakem? Do I wait for him to come back? <laughs> All right. Do you have anything else to share? No? Okay. I'll adjourn the meeting. Yeah. You put the gavel too far away from me. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you.